Good evening, everyone. My apologies for the late start this evening. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Emma Vueti. I'm the president of the Pacific Islands Council of Queensland. On behalf of our joint organizing group, the Pacific Islands Council of Queensland and Friends of the Earth Australia Climate Frontlines Program, I warmly welcome everyone to this first online forum on climate change challenges to the sovereignty of the Pacific Atoll nations. Here in Nianjin, known as Brisbane, we begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are hosting this forum from, the Turubal and Yagara peoples north and south of Maiwa, the Brisbane River. We pay our respects to the elders, past and present, and the young emerging leaders in the community. We take this time to thank them for sharing their land and sea with us here in Australia. I also take this time to acknowledge all my Pacific Island elders and leaders who have paved the way for the rest of us to follow in our collective actions as Pacific peoples on climate change and the protection of our great ocean. I now invite Stella Miria Robinson to share an opening prayer with us. Thank you, Stella. Thank you, Emma. Sirama Hamamaye, Oyobiapaka, M. Yopi, Yapawa, Kiabaha. Thank you for the opportunity for us to gather in this way as we have today. We thank you, Lord, for the wonders of our world, its amazing diversity, and the rich cultures and national identities that our people have developed in harmony with their environment. We offer to you our expressions of sorrow and concern for the ways in which these treasures that you bestowed on us in this world are being eroded and even destroyed by certain human activities with very little regard for the climate crisis we are facing. We are grateful, Father, for the opportunity this evening to hear from those who give voice to the concerns of their peoples who are amongst the least responsible and the most affected from our Blue Pacific climate frontline. We pray that all people of goodwill, of hope, of good heart and great spirit will join forces to address the challenges we face as one people and one humankind. We ask your blessing in the deliberations of this forum in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. In addition, to honor our first Australians and our esteemed panel members, I would like to bless them by reading Auntie Betty Pike's blessing. May you always stand tall as a tree, be as strong as the rock Ularu, as gentle and still as the morning mist. Hold the warmth of the campfire in your heart and may the creator spirit always walk with you wherever you are. Blessings. Thank you, Stella. <clears throat> this is the first of the three events focusing on challenges that climate change poses to the sovereignty of Pacific Atoll nations. The leaders of the Pacific Island nations have collectively made it clear to the international community that climate change is the biggest threat to the security of our peoples. Because of our unique characteristics, nations composed of atolls face particularly, particular challenges, including their sovereignty. I now would like to acknowledge and welcome our distinguished speakers, Ms. Ambulubinaka, the Honorable Enele Sopoanga, MP, 
His Excellency Anote Tong, Kathy Jetnell Kitchener, Bula, and Excellency Taloy Buri, for giving us your time for this conversation to take place with the diaspora Pacific Island communities in Australia on a sensitive topic that few leaders like yourselves have raised and spoken eloquently about in the global scene. As a voice, Pacific Islands Council of Queensland, PICQ, as we always say, highlights and makes known the issues of our communities to the federal, state, local governments and services. The focus of these online forums this year is such an issue that PICQ is raising on behalf of our communities that belong to cultures from Tuvalu, Ikiribas, and the Atoll, Pacific Atoll nations. The topic of today's forum was initiated by our Queensland Tuvalu communities through their president, Tokie Kitara, who is one of our facilitators this evening. I am grateful to our distinguished speakers for accepting our humble invitation. I'd also like to acknowledge present this evening as some of the invited delegates of the member of our member of parliament here in the federal, uh, Australian federal parliament. The Honorable Pat Conron, the Shadow Minister for International Affairs and Pacific, representatives of the Australian federal, state and local governments and representatives of uh, the diplomatic offices in Canberra and overseas. In setting the scene this evening, this forum is aimed to initiate the conversation of Talanoa and create awareness on climate change challenges on the sovereignty of Atoll Island nations. In addition, this forum endeavors to build the capacities and confidence of our young diaspora leaders who are facilitating this evening's forum. I now would like to introduce Alexandra Pitcher of the Brisbane Nauru community, Tate Maen Wickham of the Queensland Kiribati community, and Tokie Kitara of the Tuvalu Queensland Society, who are going to be our facilitators this evening. Thank you, Alexandra, Tate, and Tokie. my co-hosts introduce ourselves, we would like to acknowledge the Torobo and the Yagara people whose land we now meet on. And we would like to um, say our respect to the elders past and present. We would also like to welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who have um, joined us this evening. Welcome. As for the introductions, I guess I'll start um, by introducing myself. As my team I'm aware, I am from the islands of Kiribati. And in the Kiribati formal way, we offer more than just a, a name when we identify ourselves. So to introduce ourselves, introduce myself, oh, sorry, I would like to begin by giving you my name as well as mentioning my father and the islands of which he comes from and my mother and the islands of which she comes from. So to begin, I'm a Benini Meori. I'm a Benini Meori Arau. My name is Tate Tarita Karakawa Man. Wickham, sorry, I forget I'm married. <laughs> I am the eldest daughter of the late Dr. Tatawa Karakawa Man, who is from the islands of Korea, Aranuka, Abimeme, and Apeyang. My mother is Dr. Edith Wilson Man, and she is from Tabitowia, Mereke, Nanos, and Apeyang. I'm the current vice president for our Queensland Kiribati community here in Brisbane, and I am honored to be here and part of this amazing event on behalf of our small community, as well as our, our, our Kiribati people. I think this topic is a, one that's very interesting and we look forward to tonight's discussion. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Tate, because tonight's discussion should Papa. be Papa. very good. Mm -hmm. So again, Tawafa, to introduce myself, my name is Tokie Guitar, or in Australia, we call, they call me TK to my friends and our family. I am from Tuvalu, yeah, uh, which is one of the small islands uh, in, the, in the Pacific region. And I am too a Ikiribas from the uh, island of uh, Ararat. Mm. Uh, I am currently the president 
for the Tuvalu community here in Brisbane and a council member for the Pacific Island Council for Queensland, the RCQ. I'd like um, Tate's introduction um, and thank you for that TK. I'd follow Kiribati protocol um, and I'd like to begin by saying Moje Mera and Talo Falaba. My name is Alexandra Pitcher and I am the daughter of Frederick and Juliana Pitcher. And from my Norwegian side, I come from the tribe of Iroa, more extensively the Inoa clan. And on my mother's Samoan side, I come from the villages of Vailima and Lefanga on Apia, Western Samoa. As a young Norwegian whose island nation is only 21 square kilometers, I am also very interested in learning about tonight's discussions. Now, climate change and sovereignty has been my passion. And it is an issue that is very close to my heart. And I hope that this forum will be a platform that will enable the discussion and debate on the issue of uh, sovereignty and why it is important to understand how climate change will affect not just our sovereignty, but our values, our culture, our land and ocean space. That's so true. Um, so I guess to get uh, that conversation happening, we have this first of many of three series, so I'm, I'm told. And um, as we are all aware, we are very honored to have with us our honored speakers, the Honorable Enela Sapuanga, His Excellency, Anote Tang, Mr. Exley, Exley Taloi Budi, and our female voice for tonight's discussion is Mrs. Kathy Jetnil Kijiner. We will properly introduce the speakers as they take the floor. So to begin, we might start with Enela uh, Sapuanga, the Honorable Enela Sapuanga. Mm -hmm. Before I ask TK to introduce our speakers, just a reminder that um, you can um, put forward your questions in our, uh, to our panelists via the Q&A section at, um, located at the bottom of your screen. So, without further ado, TK, please introduce the Honorable Inela Sopoanga. Certainly. Now, our first speaker for this evening is the Honorable Inela Sopoanga, who is a member of the Tuvalu Parliament and is the leader of the um, opposition. Now, during his time as the Tuvalu uh, Prime Minister, the Honorable Enele Sopoanga uh, brought Tuvalu's fight against climate change to the international uh, stage. He served as the main spokesperson for um, the Pacific uh, Small and Developing States. Uh, at 2009, the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen, where I was fortunate enough as well to be part of that Tuvalu uh, delegation. So joining us all the way from Tuvalu, please welcome and then Thank you. and all your colleagues and my special congratulations to you, the Pacific Islands Council of uh, Queensland and also my great pleasure to seeing my great friend, uh, His Excellency uh, Arnaud Tong, leader of the Pacific and a, and a climate change warrior uh, for the small island countries, not only in the Pacific, but all over the world. Also a great uh, uh, pleasure to see our friends at the Forum Secretary, uh, as Lee, and, and, and our friend from Marshall Islands, uh, in the hope that she will be able to connect with us uh, through the technology. I, I really have to, uh, to commend you and the Council of the Pacific Islands in Queensland for this initiative, because it brings us the opportunity to, to continue to connect and for us to understand what you are doing in Australia, your beautiful island, big island country, and especially in Queensland. Now, the idea of us to talk and also to, to continue the discussion on the, this very, very important issue of impacts of climate change is, a, is not a novel one, but it is a grand idea that the importance of which is shared by, by every islander uh, uh, of the Pacific, not only in the islands like us here in Tuvalu, but certainly island boys and, and girls in Australia, New Zealand, in the diaspora. As they say, you can take the boy out of an island, but you can never take the islands of the Pacific out of the boys 
and the Young Girls of the Pacific. So congratulations for your great work. Usually the discussion on the issue of climate change uh, requires us to travel a lot of miles and burns carbon as we move to every cob, as uh, Taukei was saying. We've been through all sorts of cities to deal with the issue that is caused by the industrialized countries. And all that we are hearing are rhetorics, discussions, discussions, and burning the greenhouse gases while we travel to these capitals. Never a COP, a conference of the parties, has been held in the Pacific Island countries. We missed a COP23. We thought we were going to host it somewhere closer to the Pacific Island countries to, to showcase our case, how vulnerable we are, the special case of small island countries of the Pacific. But unfortunately, of course, did, did not, this did not eventuate much to our, to our uh, anger. We, went, we had to go again to Bonn, to that very cold, cold uh, uh, city of Bonn. And then the next uh, 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 COP, we had to go to even a colder place in Poland. Now we are said, uh, we, are, we, we are told we have to go to Glasgow. When are these people going to stop dragging us to come travel all the way when the problem was caused by them, by their industrialized countries? And by the way, I think the corona, the COVID-19, and now the necessity to move to this IT is really a blessing in disguise because we are no longer burning and burning our fossil fuels by traveling. We are stuck here and nevertheless, we are very, very, uh, uh, um, I think very, very useful that we are using the IT, the technology for us to continue dialoguing. Now, so I'm very, very grateful to be a speaker tonight. And of course, I will be very, very happy to respond to any specific questions that you may have on the, on the uh, theme for this evening climate change, challenges, and sovereignty. This is a very interesting topic. There I say we need uh, to work and discuss and find options that we would not require us to get to, into that eventuality. I certainly hope the Paris Agreement has delivered us the way forward for us to work together as a world in terms of uh, uh, mitigation, cutting emissions, but also in terms of adaptation then the issue of loss and damage, that would save the small islands as the Pacific Island countries and through the forum have said, we have to save these islands like Tuvalu in order to save the world. There is no other option so that we didn't have to leave our sovereignty. So thank you for the topic, but uh, that's my first uh, uh, cue in. I certainly hope we can do it. We can do it so that we continue to remain in Tuvalu, in Kiribati, in all the small islands of the Pacific, that we didn't have to be forced to give up our sovereignty. Kurapa, Pasinaba, thank you very much. And it's good to see you guys. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you again, Zonyabo Enele, for your important contribution and to tonight's discussion. And we hope that we will learn from it. Yes, thank you, Honorable Enele. To our attendees, just a reminder again that you can submit a question to our panelists via the Q&A section located at the bottom of your screen. Our second speaker is um, His Excellency Anote Tong. And I would like to ask Date to introduce our second speaker. My pleasure. Our second speaker for the evening is, is His Excellency Anate Tong, who is the previous president of my home island nation of the Republic of Kiribati. His Excellency is a world-renowned leader in the battles of, against mm -hmm. climate change and for ocean conservation. He's been twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Under his leadership, the government of Kiribati created the Phoenix Islands Protected Area, which is a 150,000 square mile UNESCO World Heritage Site, off limits to fishing and extractive industry. Since leaving his office, he continues to speak about the realities of climate change and the urgencies of the issues, especially relating to Kiribati. Please join me in welcoming 
His Excellency Anatta Tong. Uh, thank you, Tati, for that introduction. Uh, before I uh, start talking, uh, let me bless Maori. you as you have blessed. Okay, and so, so let me bless you, greet you, and bless you. Come down. Okay, the, uh, the topic that you've uh, invited us to speak on is indeed a challenging one because Maori. what it means it itself is, uh, is, is it poses the biggest challenge for uh, especially the, the Atoll Island countries. Yeah. And uh, let me go back a little bit. I think as, as former colonies, as countries who have been in a situation where we, I think in the, the Marshall Islands in Kiribati, we had the bomb tests, had to, uh, nuclear bomb tests. We also were part of the, the, uh, the Second World War. So as, as newly independent countries, we had a lot of apprehension going into independence. I'm sure we all went through the same process. Uh, for in, in Kiribati's case, we, we attained our independence in 1979, at the same time that the phosphate mining ceased in, in, uh, in Christmas Island. And so the, the question when uh, independence was being discussed, the question was how could we survive as a nation, as a sovereign nation, now that our source of revenue was no longer uh, available. And uh, there was even talk by people that maybe we should not go for independence, we should remain under British colonial rule. This, is, this was the kind of mentality that was uh, prevailing at the time because I was there, just come back from school and was going through the process of uh, the preparation for independence. And a lot of people were a bit, a bit apprehensive. As we became independent, the next question was, how could we uh, participate in the international, international discussion? Because we are small. We don't matter too much. We, we are irrelevant to the wider world community. How can we, uh, how can we make, how can we be heard? And uh, of course, um, you know, later on in, in, in 1982, I think we're all aware of what happened in 1982 with the, uh, the, the coming into force of the uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. I remember in, in 1978, we started negotiating with the Japanese about licensing them to fish in our waters, okay? Even before the, the law of the sea came into force. And so that brought a new dimension. Right? For, 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 from, you know, for a change, we began to think that we were a bigger country than we, we used to think we were. And of course, it brought in new revenue and uh, gave us a bit more of a breathing space. What, um, of course, also around about the 1980s, I remember as uh, secretary for the, the Ministry of Natural Resource, there was a lot of this excitement about a deep sea bed mining. And I think, I think it was then that we began to truly understand the potential of the, uh, of the more recently as a region, as small island, small island nations in the Pacific, we began to call ourselves large ocean states. And the reason is simple because we are indeed huge ocean states with huge resources. There is no question in my mind that if we can derive a higher rate of return from our fish resources, it's in the multi-billion dollar range. But at the moment, we only get a small proportion of it via the, uh, the, the licensing. So as sovereign states, I think our opportunities for development are not bad. And then of course, then came the uh, climate change challenge. The climate change challenge is posing a different kind of challenge it is suggesting that perhaps we do have an existential threat facing us, and we do. There is no question about the science. The science is very clear that uh, if all, everything continues with business as usual, the sea level will effects on our islands. The question I think now is, will we survive? the impacts of climate change? Can we continue to remain as sovereign states? And um, I think if I can express two, because I've been going through this over the years, and uh, I think there is no question in my mind that if you ask somebody from Tuvalu, you ask somebody from Kiribati, you ask somebody from the Marshall Islands, what would they like to see their country disappear? And always the answer is no. 
And I, I will explain why not. It is simple. I mean, uh, nobody wants to lose that identity. It's a source of identity. Land, homeland is a source of your identity. Without a home, you are nothing. And this is why it is so vital. Without a homeland, how can you continue to practice your culture and your tradition? Okay, so sovereignty in that respect is, is vital. The question then is, are we able to continue to survive given the projections, what is happening, what the, the IPCC is projecting and what, what else is happening? Um, even this morning, I read the story that uh, the research is, continues to go on that um, the melting of the ice is almost in the northern uh, North Pole is almost on the point that it's not going, it's not going to be reversible. And so how do we deal with that? But of course, uh, it is not an option to give up. Okay. But I've always, for me, I'm, I'd like to think that I'm a practical person. I like to keep my eggs in different baskets so that, yes, I think there are, I would be lying if I said that our young people don't want to go somewhere else. They do. I, I think in Kiribati alone, we have uh, people who are moving from the Outer Islands into South Tarawa. More than 60% of the population. Okay. And they're living in a very small, small part of the island. Why is that? Because they want to seek the opportunities. Maybe some of them are impacted by climate change, but it's more about the economic opportunities that they're looking for. Likewise, people want to go somewhere else to Australia, to New Zealand, as I think we, we have our seamen who do that. They work, we have our seasonal workers who go to Australia and New Zealand to earn, to find employment because they cannot have that kind of employment back home. So it's about all of that. The question is, do our young people want, do our people want to go? I believe so. But they always want somewhere to be able to go back to. And I think that is the point that must be, that must never be, that must never be lost. That yes, they will go, but they want a home to go back to. And this is why losing a home, our homeland is not a, an option. I don't know what our chances are of being able to do that. Already we are hearing talk about our islands going down. I know, I know I'm, I'm often um, misquoted by the media because I know it's a lot more exciting to say that the islands will go and people will mass migrate. It's always been my contention that the first option must be to build our climate resilience so that, so that we can have a home for our future generations. So that those of you who are now in Australia can say, oh, that is my homeland. My, my island used to be there, but it's no longer there. Because I don't know if it's going to be possible to be able to provide the climate resilience needed for all of the islands, maybe for some. But I doubt if we will ever be able to generate, mobilize the resources in order to, to be able to build the climate resilience necessary for the, all of the islands. And so, I've always contented myself with the, acknowledging the brutal reality. It's not nice, but I want to keep the options open just in case and already because it's happening. About if our people are to, are to, to, be, are to migrate, to be relocated, then they must migrate with dignity. Let me share with you the concept of what it is I mean with well, what I mean about migration with dignity. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the project that we initiated with the Australian government, the Howard government, the, um, the Kiribati Australia Nursing Initiative. What it is, is our young people go train and go train in Brisbane, actually, at Griffith University. And they train, they, they, they are trained to be nurses. And now, and have the option either to go back home to work or to stay in Australia to work. Quite a number of them are there in Brisbane working. And that was the concept that I'd always been talking about migration with dignity, that people would be provided with the training to skill so that they don't go into the slum areas, but they go, they go as skilled people. And it's been done, it can be replicated. I mean, the models have been there. I know that particular project was slightly expensive, but it could, could have been done more efficiently. And so that was the idea. Okay, the, um, 
how, what do we do with our sovereignty? I know there's been talk about having a compact agreement. I know that one of the former prime ministers in Australia suggested that we, we maybe we go to Australia, but we give Australia our exclusive economic zones to, to possess and to manage on our behalf. I don't know exactly how it would be done, but there's been some discussion of that. Uh, it already exists, such arrangements already exist with New Zealand and some of the um, Polynesian countries like uh, Cook Islands, Anue, uh, Tukelau, and, uh, and, of, and of course to the, to the north we have a compact agreement uh, between the US and Marshall Islands and the micro, Micronesia. So they're not new. But topping all of that is the new dimension. And the new dimension being the Chinese movement into the, I don't know if you've been following what's been happening, but the, um, with the, the change of uh, relationship between the Solomon Islands to, to, um, to China. Now the U.S. is working, is offering to provide a lot of assistance to Malaita. But I think this is a new dimension that might assist us in providing that sovereignty, in, in, in trying to maintain that sovereignty, the, the, uh, the security component. So that we are beginning to be more, we are beginning to become more relevant in the security considerations of the allies. I don't know how it would turn out, but I know that there is some concern. I've been involved in some workshops which uh, uh, discuss this, but I know that there is huge concern with the, um, what is happening in the Ch South China Sea. We can see that in Australia, there's been confrontation between the government and China over trade and what have you. And uh, even the very prospect of war is very real at this, at this point in time. And so these are the issues that I want to raise in terms of sovereignty. I think it's been changing. COVID-19 maybe has contributed in some way, but, and I think I, I like to make a point, the relationship between COVID-19 and climate change is all of the things that the developed countries thought were not possible to be done because it would be too damaging to their economies. They did it when COVID-19 came. And the reason is very simple because with COVID-19, everybody, is a target. There are no beneficiaries. But with climate change, there are those who believe that their source of wealth will be threatened, would be threatened by, by the, uh, the remedies that are needed in order to deal with climate change. But the reality is the, the, the global economy has perhaps suffered more with, from COVID-19 than it would have had we put into place those remedies which were needed to cut emissions. Let me stop there. Thank you. Um, for sharing, for sharing, sharing your input with us tonight. And um, yeah, actually you mentioned the Kitipas students. And the the Kitipas community here in Brisbane is actually quite bigger because since the, those new nurses have come in and exactly we there are very active members of society and gay community and they've got the next generation of Kitipas Australian Australians uh, kids coming around so it's good to get, it's good to see that movement and I, I, I just thought of it when you brought that up but um yeah that's great it's great um <clears throat> before we go on to our next speaker I think we would just ask um just like to remind everybody that again you can put questions down at the bottom in the Q&A box locally just be, like just below your screen thank you Tate and thank you um your excellency mm -hmm. um this brings us to our third speaker this evening um, our third speaker is Kathy Jetnil Kijina. She is the current Climate Envoy for the Marshals, a poet, director, and co founder of the environmentalist youth nonprofit group Jojikum. She received international acclaim for her poetry performance in the United Nations Climate Summit in New York 2014. And um, without further ado, I'd like to thank Kathy for your time and for joining us tonight. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, first, I want to apologize. I'm not sure. I guess I can try and turn on the video for a little bit. I'm calling in. Hi. I'm calling in from the Marshall Islands, and I'm not entirely sure how good the connection is. Um, so I'm going to maybe keep the video off 
for now and um, just share my uh, remarks. Is Can you hear me okay? It's okay? Yeah. Yep, yeah. yeah, good. You're good to go. Okay. Now I now I can't hear you guys, but I I guess I'll. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Can you hear? Us? Well, I guess just. Uh, yeah. I think. I think there's been some technical difficulties. I apologize for that. I think we will move on to the next speaker and then we'll come back to Kathy afterwards. So, um, Kathy, thank you for your brief time. We'll come back to you um, for your, your question. Um, and I'll just ask TK to introduce the next speaker, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. Look, our next speaker, his, uh, his name is Mr. Exley Solomon <coughs> And he's the, um, the climate finance um, advisor and also the resilience team leader at the Pacific Islands Forum uh, Secretariat, the PIPS. Uh, he has led important work on national climate finance assessments and reviews in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, Republic of Palau, and Solomon Islands, among other Pacific nations. Exley, thank you for being here, and over to you. Thank you very much, um, co-moderators, um, excellencies, representatives of federal and state governments, Ms. Emma Wetty, President of the Pacific Islands Council of Queensland, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, Nisa Bula, Talofa, Yakwe, Maori, Malolele, Ali, Kasaleli, Kiorana, Pakalofa Atu, Moseko, and Hello Olketa to all the participants joining us uh, <laughs> online this evening. I am from the beautiful island of uh, Malaita where His Excellency just mentioned a while ago in the Solomon Islands, but I'm joining you this evening from Suva where um, I work. First, let me uh, take this opportunity to thank the organizers for extending the invitation to the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat. It's indeed a privilege to be part of this event on behalf of my Secretary General, Dale, Dame Meg Taylor, and join the esteemed panel consisting of three internationally recognized climate change advocates, two of which are former heads of state. I have been asked to speak on what Pacific Island Forum leaders see as challenges to the sovereignty of their nations because of climate change, in particular maritime boundaries. As you know, climate change is a regional priority for Pacific Island Forum leaders and has been on their agenda over the past 20 years. Recently, this has gained momentum noting the urgency of the climate change crisis facing the Blue Pacific region. In 2018, Pacific Island Forum leaders elevated climate change as a regional security issue to the Boy Declaration. Last year, under the able leadership of Prime Minister Sopoanga, Forum leaders reaffirmed climate change as the single greatest threat facing the Pacific and its people and collectively issued the Kainake Lua Declaration for Urgent Climate Change Action Now. The 10 calls underpinning the Kainake Lua Declaration for Urgent Climate Change Action Now calls for real tangible outcomes that yeah. will ensure the survival of our region, our blue planet, and the basis for aligning COVID-19 recovery with the Paris Agreement out uh, goals. Also in 2019, leaders noted with concern the threat posed by sea level rise to securing the Blue Pacific and reaffirm their commitment to conclude negotiations on all outstanding maritime boundaries, claims and zones, and to preserve members' existing rights stemming from maritime zones in the face of sea level rise. Pacific leaders committed to a collective effort, including to develop international law with the aim of ensuring that once a forum member's maritime zones are delineated, in accordance with the 1982 UN Convention of, of, on the Law of the Sea, that the members' maritime zones could not be challenged or reduced as a result of sea level rise and climate change. Over the last year, members continued to progress towards the conclusion of negotiations on outstanding maritime boundaries, claims, and zones, as well as extended continental self submissions with technical assistance from regional organizations, and also the Maritime Boundaries Consortium of Partners. <clears throat> to, uh, 
through the forum chair, uh, the permanent representative of Tuvalu to the United Nations, a forum submission was made to the International Law Commission process on sea level rise in relation to international law, as well as a forum contribution to the report of the UN Secretary General on sea level rise and its impacts for the open-ended informal consultative process on oceans and the law of the sea. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected related global events and negotiations for advancing international law development processes in 2020. However, to advance the forum leaders' commitments, the forum chair and the forum secretariat hosted a virtual 2020 regional conference in September, focusing on the limits of the Blue Pacific, legal options and institutional responses to the impacts of sea level rise on maritime boundaries. Last week, some of you may be aware that the forum foreign ministers meeting did discuss progress updates in implementing the 2019 forum leaders decisions and commitments relating to maritime boundaries and sea level rise. And at the same time, re-emphasize the need to counter against the ongoing threat posed by sea level rise to securing the Blue Pacific continent. Among other decisions, two notable ones worth sharing for your information include one, support for the development of a regional declaration on maritime boundaries for leaders consideration in 2021, and two, endorse in principle the establishment of a forum officials committee, especially subcommittee on sea level rise in relation to international law. There is opportunity for the Pacific Islands community in Australia to provide input to the regional declaration in 2021 and also the work of the specialist subcommittee on this pertinent issue. Going forward, I must emphasize that the science is very clear as already highlighted by our three distinguished panelists before me. We are now at 1.1 degrees Celsius and in, in, if unabated, some of our low-lying atolls will become un inhabitable within our lifetime or as early as by 2030. Every year that international climate action is delayed, our future as a region becomes more uncertain. While this issue of, re of uh, re resolving negotiations on maritime boundaries is an, an important adaptation measure, we must not lose focus on the need to address the underlying cause of climate change, which is to cut down greenhouse gas emissions to avoid loss and damage. COVID-19 should not be used as an excuse to delay much needed urgent action on climate change and should not trigger economic recovery that puts this world on a development pathway that takes us beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius to a point of no return. The carbon footprint of Pacific Island countries is negligible compared to the rest of the world. However, our Pacific Island countries are already punching above their weight in regards to the NDC commitments that they have submitted under the Paris Agreement. The island countries look towards Australia as a founding member of the Pacific Islands Forum to step up its climate change action to safeguard 1.5 degrees Celsius pathway in order to stay alive. I thank you. And thank you again for tonight's, uh, this evening's speakers and for your time and contribution. Um, I'm afraid uh, Kathy might not be able to join us due to technical difficulties, but um, we will record her presentation and we will share it with the attendees and everyone on the panel. So without further ado, we'll move on to the Q&A sec uh, sec section and we'll start with the first question. And the question is addressed to the Honorable Nele Sapoanga. So the question is, um, Minister, you were Tuvalu's first ambassador to the United Nations, joined in 2000. Sorry, let me put on my glasses. What were the highlights of your experience representing Tuvalu as a sovereign nation in the global arena? Honorable Nelly Sapoa, you were there with your dad. Can, can you hear it? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, I was saying that it is uh, pleasing to see you, Miss uh, Peacher. You were also in New York at the time I was, I was there as yeah. ambassador. Your dad was a counselor, was a deputy ambassador for Nauru. 
and uh, and yeah. Jane, your mum. Give my regards to your your folks. And now you are you are a big girl now, but you know my my experience in Manhattan in New York was uh, eventually to take over leadership of the Alliance of Small Island States, AOSIS, when Neroni Ambassador Neroni Slate of Samoa uh, completed his term there, and then I took up the uh, as chief negotiator for the small islands. Uh, of the world, the Pacific, Caribbean, and the Indian Ocean. So that was perhaps the, 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 it was so inspiring to be leader of the small island countries, negotiating with the, the tough guys. And, and we were even accorded the, the, the wording, uh, punching above our weight. And of course, we were big guys, uh, much bigger than the, than the, uh, the American negotiators. But still, we, we were fighting our, all our efforts, all exerting our, our efforts to, to make sure our voice is heard. And in order to, be, to do that, we have to work together, uh, all together, members of the Alliance of Small Island State, 43 uh, countries, all represented in the United Nations. I took over leadership after Neroni Slate left and uh, with all the ambassadors of the Pacific Island countries, uh, of, uh, of Nauru, of Samoa, of Tonga, and those guys, Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands, I think Giribasi was coming around uh, as well, uh, His Excellency Margarita Paro, and all these uh, team worked together in order to project the concerns of uh, the Pacific Island countries. So the achievements I think we managed to get the Kyoto Protocol entered into force in, in, in 05. We managed to do the Mauritius strategy of implementation uh, uh, with focusing also on climate change. And we managed also to, to start the grassroots of work towards a more comprehensive agreement on climate change. And this is what we are now calling the Paris Agreement that came out of all efforts of the Alliance of Small Island States, LDCs, and other major negotiating parties. I must also compliment our regional uh, organizations uh, from the Pacific, the SPC, the SPREP, the Forum Secretariat, uh, and SOPEC at the time was still alive, um, who, who were helping us a lot. So, uh, and also negotiators individually from Pacific Island countries, many of whom I know many of whom uh, I know they are still around in, in the Pacific and taking leadership role in climate change. So it's a collective effort. And I'm so proud when we got the Paris Agreement adopted in Paris and eventually signed by all of us, except uh, some major countries were still uh, swimming around. So that is, uh, uh, I mean, help. leading. So when I was chairing the the Pacific Island Leaders Forum last year, all these were not new to me. Uh, and in fact, we and His Excellency, we've been on the, on the floor in many COPs. I personally have has been on the floor since COP3 uh, in Kyoto. Three, four, five, six, seven, you lose count. Now is COP, what is it, okay? Now is COP26 or COP20? I'm going there to Glasgow if it happens. I personally have committed to going there because the whole issue is uh, uh, people have asked me, have you considered the option of relocation? I said, no, there is no plan B. The only plan they, I as leader of Tuval have on the table is for the world to address, to reach, keep the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that means keep, keeping the uh, emissions of greenhouse gases to 350 parts per million. You can never go above that. The IPCC report has, has warned us, we go beyond that, the whole uh, um, globe will face catastrophes, particularly the small island countries. So while the moving away, relocating your people may be considered as an option, it cannot be an option now. We must fight for our rights. 
the rights of the Pacific Island countries of Tuvaluans to remain in their God-given islands forever and never, never losing out their sovereignty. And let's talk about these small island nations sub submerged of, or absorbed as territories to, to Australia uh, made by a former prime minister, surprisingly. This is totally unacceptable, never. We are never going to be colonized again or be treated as neo-colonial subjects, never. Because we achieved our independence, we are going to remain in our territory and maintain our sovereignty and our cultural identity forever. If we were to be relocated, the community has to be relocated as a nation of Tuvalu, with all full rights protected about under international law. And that's why you may know, Ashley of course should know, that Tuvalu uh, under my leadership has initiated in the United Nations a convention to deal to protect the rights of people impacted by climate change. We need to have that. Right now, in, under international law, there is no regime to identify a climate change refugee. There is none. The only convention that exists refers to migrants, migrants that, that migrate under current international law. There is nothing legal framework to provide for the rights of people to be dislocated by climate change. There is none. We have to do it through the United Nations. And the sooner we do that, the better. Otherwise, we lose our baselines by, through erosion because of sea level rise and tropical cyclones. We lose the demarcation of what you said is dependent on baselines. Without baselines, you cannot measure your territorial waters and your 200 miles off. So it's very, very serious. Of course, I, we, are, we are informed of geopolitical things going on in the Pacific, but we must not lose sight. This could be a conspiracy by the polluter, the polluters who cause uh, uh, all the industrialized who cause these, uh, these emissions to the atmosphere for them to escape their responsibility to pay for the damage, for the rubbish that they dump into the atmosphere from which we are suffering. So I'm quite strong on this. And I thought the communique in Kainakilua, as Ashley referred to, it's an urgent transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy in order to keep within the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, temperature. Unfortunately, Australia, Prime Minister of Australia, has not done, he has not followed up what he committed into the Pacific leaders that they will transist, trans, trans, transfer or move on from fossil fuels, coal mining, to clean, to renewable energy. That is a commitment that is there in the communique. So we can, uh, we thank, I thank my colleague in the Foreign Secretary for uh, reminding us, but we cannot pick and choose. We must look at the communique as a whole. And leaders of the Pacific, I hope, must come and follow up and step up their actions. Not through just funding for nothing. They must follow their responsibility of helping to fund emission reductions, but especially adaptation. And when we come to the issue of loss and damage, it's even more that they have to give, not ODA, because financing for climate change is not a development uh, uh, vehicle process. It is for charity, of course, ODA is another uh, method. But climate change financing is based on accountability and responsibility and the moral obligation of those who cause the polluter, pollute the environment to pay. I certainly hope and I certainly call on the Australian uh, government to please honor the communicate uh, Kainaki Lua and move away from fossil fuels, from coal mining to renewable energy. That will save Kiribati and Tuvalu and Marshall Islands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Lapa. and Marshall Island. Um,
I just want to also mention, like, I, I remember reading that article that you wrote uh, for the Canberra Times about, yeah, with the plea against rem reminding Australia of the commitment from in the, um, the, re the recent communique from the last year's PIFs. Um, and I think there was an interesting quote that you mentioned in there that I, I, and I, I kind of, it kind of resonated with me. Um, you mentioned in there how, yes, right now with uh, COVID-19, um, a lot of the country now is, and countries around the world's focus is all on that at the moment. And, you know, it's, it's very sad to see what it's doing in the world, right? But the thing is, you know, they have the hope of a vaccine, you know? Unfortunately for our Pacific people, you know, we are, our struggles is undermined by COVID at the moment. But unfortunately, unlike the, the rest of the world, we don't really have a hope unless the world also seizes at something that needs to be addressed and focused on as well. But yeah, that's true. And then like, um, I'd like to reiterate uh, Exley's words were, as, as bad as COVID-19 is, and we appreciate us here in Australia, we feel it. At the same time, it's not an excuse to put the Pacific people on the side, on hold until, you know? So I guess it'd be, it'd be a great time to call into the governments and how we can, yes, feel and, and um, address what's happening with COVID in society, but at the same time, also understand and have, hopefully even get a better idea of what's happening in the Pacific with the struggles, you know? But yes, no, thank you, Honorable and Elisa Pronga for those words. Thank you, Elisa Pronga. And uh, thank you for, you know, speaking about, yeah. speaking out about uh, mm. the reduction of carbon emissions, mm. you know. Now, there, there, there's another question that's being posed at the moment from our um, participants across uh, the world. And the question is, how can we, or who are uh, not part of the, the British Commonwealth, you know, Commonwealth realm, bring greater awareness of the, the challenges to sovereignty and climate change effects in Kiribati, Tuvalu, Marshall Islands, and other adult nations uh, in our islands in the Western Micronesia, and also you know, our people in the diaspora. And um, who would we like to address this? Yeah, this no, I believe no, this question. Uh, absolutely. I, I think. Well, yes. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. I, I, anyone, the no, question no. is Anybody? a valid one. And I, I, I thank you. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Uh, but the, I understand the Commonwealth of Nations that is headed by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth is fully aware of this. And they have. Uh, several technical committees that work with the Commonwealth, including also in collaboration with the Forum Pacific Islands uh, Forum. Um, so they are uh, working. They, I think, they are very successful in in still co um, advocating for a greater uh, emission reductions, and they are uh, to some extent working with the European uh, Union in through their own context. But I think in combination climate change and COVID, the basic message is that we must be very serious about science. Both require the scientific approach to dealing with climate change and COVID-19. There is no other way you can deal with this unless you follow the scientific. And now for, for climate change and global warming, we are advised by IPCC which is a body of scientists of the world that, that we need to do urgent actions to reduce greenhouse gases. Unless we do that, there is no hope of us going back to normalcy. Science in the area of COVID-19, we have to follow the science and look at the precautions. And of course, working with science to provide the, uh, the medicine that is necessary. But let me bring it to the, to the context of the Commonwealth countries. These island countries, like the small island countries of the Pacific, are special case. And they are least developed countries as well. They are special case, recognized under the Mauritius strategy of implementation, but also in the Samoa pathway. What is that special case? What is the meaning of that special case if the world ignore us do not provide us with the vaccines, with respirators, with uh, uh, ventilators. The other day, the US government, a representative uh, in Suva was talking about sending to Tuvalu 10 resp uh, uh, respirators, ventilation mas machines, 10. Is that enough? 
Would that address the science behind COVID for the whole country of 12,000 people? This is very, very shameful. The world industrialized countries must help the small island countries uh, through WHO because they are a special case. They recognize it in the Samoa pathway. Why recognize it in only words, but no actions? This is the thing that irritates me. And I certainly call on Australia to be more forthcoming, you know, and, and helping the small island countries for Tuvalu. I was asking the other day, how can, you know, New Zealand is considering sending Hercules planes to repatriate people from Tuvaluans from New Zealand to, to Tuvalu? What is Australia uh, government doing? They have a lot of uh, Hercules. They could have flown you people or uh, Tuvaluans who are there in, stuck or Kiribati stuck in Brisbane to go and meet their families uh, because of the lockdown. So these are the dynamics that we need to put these things into perspective. Now, the Commonwealth uh, of Nations, I think they are doing a great job. United Kingdom is helping us in climate change. Did you remember? It was Stephen Stern, professor, who pointed us to requiring the assessment of IPCC on the impacts of 1.5 degrees to small island countries. So I think we need to continue working together, uh, members of the Commonwealth, members of the United Nations, but especially also through the Pacific Island Leaders Forum. Thank you, uh, Honourable Nelly. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, can I just, because uh, I believe this, uh, if you don't mind me just asking the team in the background, this, this question came from, from the Marshall Islands. And um, I guess it could we also get maybe just, um, if we could ask uh, the, uh, sorry, His Excellency Olympia Tong for his uh, also comments on the, the same question. Would you like me to repeat the question or were you okay to go? Sorry, just. Your Excellency, uh, could you repeat it? I didn't catch all of it. Did you no worries, yeah. So this question comes from, we don't have his name on here at the moment, but he's from the Marshall Islands. Mas, Mas from the Marshall Islands. Thank you, Mas, for your question. Um, the question um, states, how can we, who are not part of the British Commonwealth realm, bring greater awareness of the challenges to sovereignty and climate change effects in Kiribati, Tuvalu, Marshall Islands, and other atoll nations of, to our islands in Western Micronesia and our people in diaspora? Yeah, uh, you know, the, um, the, the reality is, um, you know, the, the Southern Pacific tends to be looked after by uh, Australia and New Zealand, all right? Um, um, Polynesia, mostly by New Zealand. Micronesia by the US, but we're in the middle of nowhere. I, I often regard ourselves, you know, the, this is Kiribati, uh, Tuvalu, and, um, and Nauru. Okay, we tend to be in that place where we're out, I think, as maybe as former British colonies, uh, our colonial masses have gone and we're left alone, all right? And so, and so this is why we remain with the, the, the British Commonwealth. Uh, but the, the, really the question is, uh, how could we share and communicate the, the, the message? And I think we are doing it by this very forum uh, uh, that we are doing here now. And I think it's about um, telling the story, okay? And uh, sharing our passion. I think we are doing this. Uh, at this very moment, we're sharing the passion. I think there's a lot of passion in this because it's, it's about our homes going, okay? And we don't seem to be able to tell the world to the extent that they would listen. I mean, we signed that agreement in Paris, all right? But are we really meeting the targets? That is a, a question that needs to be um, evaluated. And it needs to be evaluated by the end of this year. This, there should be a review every five years. And I, but I, my understanding is we're nowhere near meeting the targets that we set ourselves in, in Paris. And so I think the, the, it's, it's, the, it's our past history of how we were divided up as colonial, colonial countries. I mean, mm. Micronesia was under the British, not the Americans. We were under the British, they left the Americans are still with the um, Micronesia. 
in, 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 in Polynesia, uh, New Zealand is still there, Australia is still with Papua New Guinea. And uh, we speak the same language, American English and British English, of course, but we, we share the same language. But uh, apart from that, I think we, we need to interact more. I, I see that my, my, my current president is now part of the, the Micronesian grouping, which uh, now are taking, uh, you know, getting together. We didn't quite do that uh, much during my time in office. But I can see that there is that apparent movement by Micronesia to the north. I think you, you must be aware of this, and I think in the Foreign Secretary, uh, there is at the moment a, a, a huge debate on, about the selection of the next Secretary General. And there's even a threat by the Micronesians to even leave the, the Pacific Island Forum if uh, their wishes are not uh, respected. Or if, if an agreement that was, an, a gentleman's agreement that was made in the past is not honored. Okay, it's a big move. I know, I don't know I, how I would have done it. But it's a, it's a huge move. But I think it's a, it's a question, again, it's a question of respect, understanding that yeah. uh, no matter what our, how small we might be, we, we demand that we have equal say in all of the things that we do. So, you know, in terms of Micronesia, I think we've shared the, we, we shared the, same, the same fate. Mm -hmm. And so we are telling the same story. I think that the young poet who was unable to join us this evening is extremely eloquent at saying what he said. She says in so many beautiful words what we try to say in, in, in a long speech, okay? She's mm -hmm. so effective. But I think um, that message is being conveyed. And I think the, our Northern neighbors need to be on board more. I think, I don't know why is it that they continue to be not as engaged, but I think they are engaged. I think as, as a region, the Pacific has been very solid in its position to, to the Paris Agreement. I mean, there, there was no, um, there was no, there was a very solid uh, group uh, out of the Pacific for the, um, the, the Paris discussion. So I think it's there, the communication is there, but I think it's, uh, we need to stay together. And I think as the Prime Minister Sapong has said, <laughs> we need to keep working together collectively in order to push, push this, because yeah. we are pushing against very, very powerful forces here. Thank you. For well, sure, thank, thank you, and then, um, sorry, Your Excellency and Tong for your answer. And I think that's a good point. That's a great point. Like, um, I think also to continue with what you're saying, it's the same in our communities. And I think now we also have the advantage of the internet. So it's, it's great that you pointed out that this is also one effective way where we can all come together online and talk and make our voices heard as a, as a one unit. But yes, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank you for your um, answer as well. I completely agree with you. Um, the next question is also addressed to you, Your Excellency Anote. This is from Beck, who is the Executive Director of La Trobe Asia. And her question is, what needs to happen to develop international law in order to ensure that Pacific maritime boundaries are preserved once they are delimited? Prime Minister, would you like to respond first? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Excellency President, uh, go for it. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. I, I think you've touched on that, uh, Prime Minister. It, <laughs> we need to, we, we just need to, to be heard. I, I think um, in, in the, when we started talking about climate change, we didn't believe that we would be able to influence the world because we're small nations, but we did. There is no question that. Uh, as a region, as a grouping, we, the Pacific contributed very significantly to the debate on climate change. And I believe in the conclusion of the Paris Agreement. Um, I also believe without a doubt that um, what we did in, in, in APIA in 2014, I think, was to incorporate the ocean as a separate agenda mm -hmm. on, the, um, on, the, um, on the sustainable, um, yeah. is something, you know, because we come from a very powerful position. We are, for us, the oceans are, are, are a part of our life, okay? We are large ocean states and we matter. And so we need, we need to voice this because nobody else, no other, not many other countries have, the, um, have the, the legitimacy to push it. And if they push it, they, they don't have the kind of um, ocean space that we do have. 
And of course, I think on the moral, on, at, at the moral level, I mean, simply because we lose our homes or our islands, we lose our, our what? Our islands because of what somebody else did on the other side of the world, we lose our exclusive economic zone? I don't believe so. But I think we need to keep hammering on this point. That it's, um, you know, I, I've often thought about this and I've often challenged people who said no, the, the international law, I said, no, there is in the law of the sea that did not cater for this, the rise in sea level. And so it's, it's new ground. And so it's, it's got, there's got to be new provisions to deal with that. But simply because we lost some piece of land because of others, what others did to damage our world, we're not going to lose our, our exclusive economic zones as well. I think it's a, it's a deeply moral issue. It's part of the whole debate on climate change. It's about our sovereignty, about our culture, it's about our tradition. We are losing it or it's being threatened. And yet we're being told that because of what is happening that somebody else created, we're also going to lose our exclusive, our exclusive economic zone. I don't think this is on. I'm sure we have, we have the, the, the moral high ground to come again and push this issue. And I think we should do that again. We need to work together. Thank you, Prime Minister. I'm sure you have a lot to say on this. Um, well, you've covered uh, very well. Thank you very much, Your Excellency President. Uh, just to add on <clears throat> to uh, what Anote has uh, said, two points in fact uh, the first one is to do to deal with the baselines that is the technical uh, area that is provided under the UNCLOS the law of the sea uh, the baselines are, are defined there but the the issue relating to climate change is the protection of those baselines and uh, making them permanent regardless of the uh, rise of sea uh, level, uh, but uh, keeping Tuvalu's baseline as permanent. That is the an issue that uh, was raised. Uh, we raised it during the uh, 2017 or 18 uh, UN conference on oceans in New York. And it was uh, picked up by, by uh, the UNCLOS, the unit, uh, UNIPOLOS of the United Nations. And uh, I was promised that they would start working on that. So I, I certainly hope the the Pacific Island Leader uh, Forum Secretariat and our ex group of experts in the Pacific would uh, explore more how we can legalize this. Of course, we can put it in our national constitutions and laws, and that would make it even stronger for us to put the argument to regional level and certainly to uh, international level. And also links to the initiative that I suggested for a convention on the protection of the rights of people impacted by climate change. The second one, it has to do with the geopolitical uh, 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 sphere uh, or influence that we are being uh, drawn into. I think President Anote has referred to it. But the interplay of these, uh, uh, these guys into the, the Pacific region, um, Initia sort of tempted me to suggest for a pan Pacificana, for a united um, Pacific Island countries. And that's why I made the theme of the forum here in Tuvalu is the security of the future of Pacific Island countries. And I was having this in mind. If the small island countries can come together and define their territories as one united front. No player outside of the Pacific would come and, uh, and influence around these 18 or 16 sovereign independent countries defined their territories and their economies in accordance with current international law, but then call for stronger uh, international law to guide the protection of those rights. Now, it is uh, uh, perhaps a, a far-fetching uh, idea, but I thought this would balance up the influence of these suggestions to take our territories uh, like Tuvalu and Gibas and to be submerged under a, a, a country, a 
a industrialized metropolitan country. This is unacceptable to me. But I, I think if we put our sovereignties together, if we would command this Pacific region, ocean region, much bigger than the European Union uh, territorial place, if we combine the Micronesians, the Melanesians, the Polynesian stretched into people are referring category, I mean, um, casually to Blue uh, Pacific. I think we, what we should really be referring to is, is a united Pacific uh, continent, bringing together the 16 independent sovereign countries, like what we have under the forum, under that definition. Now, we demarcate that area, it would be bigger than the European Union, bigger than many of the industrialized countries. And therefore, the influence of, of our side players would be kept in check. This is an exercise that I certainly hope our friend Ashley uh, in the Foreign Secretary uh, would explore more, getting our own experts to dwell and think about this possibility for the Pacific. If we can have work on the drift net and command the respect of the world in having an international convention on drift net, I can't see why we cannot do this, you know, to, uh, to save our sovereignty and then we become a big, big ocean continent. That's my idea to this, but it's only an idea. It may be utopian, but perhaps our experts can have dwell on this, uh, on this idea. We have to do this because we are small in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. We do this and protect the other players coming in to take over. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Honorable Anelis Sopoanga. And I think that, that that also goes into line with the first question that was asked earlier, I, I believe, the question from Mass and um, all the way from the Marshall Islands. And that's another way by coming together, regardless, uh, breaking off what um, his excellency referred to as how we were colonized. We, I, I guess it's for us as a Pacific people to change the diet, the, what's the word, the conversation and, and the lines and, and, and the identity in the group, right? Like kind of creating that and, and then pushing for it together as one whole unit, yep. Yeah. And I would, would like to welcome back Kathy. Um, she's able now to share uh, her thought. Uh, Kathy, we welcome you again. Please go ahead while we have you. Um, there are a few questions that were posed that you might like to um, share your opinion on. Uh, we have a question, um, especially for, for Kathy. Uh, this question comes from, uh, was asked by the Friends of the Earth Australia. Now, a group of Indigenous Australians from the Torres Strait Island um, appear to the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council in 2015, 2019. Or 2019, sorry, asking it to hold the Australian government to account for violating their physical, uh, social and cultural rights because of Australia's lack of serious action to address climate change. Now, the Australian um, government challenged the claim and argued that it, it concerns future risk rather than impact. Mm -hmm. Being felt now, uh, how... How, what do you think the what your ideas on this on this question? Sorry, so the question is about um, the Queensland Australia and the Donny coal mine and not taking responsibility for it. Is that specifically what they're asking? So I, it's in regards to the Torres Strait Island, Islanders' appeal to the United Nations Human Rights in, yeah, in regards to their the violation of the Australia to them for their cultural and physical rights. Um, so yeah, their human rights. So yeah, so the, the, Australian, yeah, the Australian government has uh, re 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 refuted the, the argument as rather it says it's more, co it's more concerns for future risk rather than the impacts. So what, what are your thoughts towards this, to the, this current situation? Um, I would say that that's totally inaccurate. I mean, these are not future impacts. These are current impacts, right? And it's impacting our cultures and it's impacting our livelihoods. I mean, how do you plan for a future 
And how do you plan mm. for your community if it's already affecting your community, you know, in, in, in various ways? I'm not super familiar with how Torres Strait Islanders are affected by climate change, but I know how the Marshall Islands is getting affected. It's changing the way that we plan for our development. You know, like when you're mm. planning and strategizing for the development of a country, you don't necessarily have to think about climate change, you know, destroying your entire island and, and taking away your sovereignty. But this is how we're now planning for the future um, for our islands. And in terms of human rights, um, so the Marshall Islands actually uh, collaborated recently to uh, host the, um, a conference between the Marshall Islands, Kiribati, Tuvalu, and other members of CANCC, the, Co the Coalition of Atoll Nations, to discuss the human rights impacts of climate change. Mm. And you know, how, how, what, what are the intersections specifically? Um, and so with, within the UN human rights framework, and in climate change framework, the UNFCCC, uh, these two realms tend to be considered separate, you know, in some ways, which is, is, is strange, you know, in, in, uh, as far as um, kind of the, the, the technical ways of intersections. And so I, I completely, it, it was a really, it was a really interesting um, conference that helped us sort of highlight, first of all, the climate change impacts but then also, second of all, the ways in which we at the country level, at the national level, are addressing those human rights impacts and planning for those human rights impacts. And so when we're looking at, you know, um, let me see, when we're looking at cultural rights and social rights, I think that's so hard to address, you know, in, the, in a world that basically does not recognize cultural rights and does not see the, the impacts or the or the importance of cultural rights, you know, the social, uh, social impacts of cultural rights. And so I think when I, when I think about climate change and, and cultural rights, it reminds me of when I tried to explain our connection to land. And um, a journalist, an American journalist was talking to me about it. And he said, well, can you explain that more? Because for those of us who don't have that cultural connection to land, that doesn't mean anything to us. It just you know, we wonder why can't you just pick up and leave? It's just land, you know? And so I think that kind of disconnect between that mm. connection that we have and that, and culture, what culture means to us is, is, mm. is going to make it really difficult to fight at these international realms on this, on this issue, you know, when the wider public, you know, through colonization, through globalization has essentially wiped out and you know culture in a lot of different ways. So um, yeah, I think that's that's where my mind's going on those uh, on those kinds of different topics. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. There is a I think that that is a big problem that I think we face as islanders and trying to again push for our, our um, argument and our claims for the troubles that we're dealing with because there there is that disconnect that Kathy has mentioned. And and I guess it all again coming back again to what we were just discussing earlier, like what Emile. Um, uh, sorry, the Honorable Nila Sifuang has suggested, you know, we need to kind of come together. Like, I mean, dare I bring up the, dare I bring up the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, just that impact of, you can see now everyone's listening, everyone's talking, everyone's taking it a lot more seriously, you know, but that's nothing new, right? So it, it, it may be exactly, I guess, putting what the topics of conversations we've had tonight and back to this, and it, it's bringing back to that, that connection. We need to kind of connect our issues and, and really bring it back to the Australian government so they, do, they don't see it as just a, you know, just a future impact, but it's our reality. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great, Kathy. And, and thank you so much, Kathy, for, your, for joining us. It's so great to see you here with us today. Um, yeah, I'm maybe glad just, I made it work. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, we were wondering if, um, if you could please share your presentation. Yes, um, so I actually, no. yeah, uh, before, the dis before I disconnect again. <laughs> um, so I don't have a show or anything, but um, there was specific things I wanted to share. And I, I especially want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues on the panel who are definitely much more seasoned and, you know, leaders that I looked up to as I, as I entered into the, into the climate change realm, into the work of climate change. 
um, you know, both of them I've, I've looked up to mm -hmm. for a long time and, yeah. I've, and I've learned a lot from Exley also in his work in PIF. So I'm, I'm really grateful for to be here first off. Um, second off, uh, I think I, I, I had a whole written statement, but I'm going to just more talk story. Um, I entered this kind of space as a poet, you know, as a poet that was engaging on climate change issues and in, in the ways in which it was impacting me as a, as a citizen, as, as a person, you know, and, and the, the fear that I felt once I started to learn how vulnerable we are and how serious climate change was. And one of the ways in which it really attracted me or one of the ways that I was drawn into the conversation initially was the ways that journalists would constantly ask, where are they going to move? Will they still have passports? And that was the angle of questioning. And I think that when we're looking at sovereignty, again, it sort of feels like jumping the gun a bit, you know, like we're not really there yet, but it still is a really important conversation to have. And so this is something that Marshall Islands has been considering. And this is something I have thought about as a Marshallese and I use poetry and art. And as someone who grew up in the States and not on my own island, I use art to, to learn more about my culture and to learn more about the stories that connect us to that land and the ways in which culturally, you know, everyone owns land in the Marshall mm. Islands. Everyone can, can claim a piece of land and every piece of land has a story, has a, a, a chant, a song um, that's, you know, you can point to a coral head and it has this, you know, hundred year old story that can be passed down generation to generation. And so, that tells us initially that importance of land. But as I started to learn more and more about climate change and I kept writing and I kept performing, I wanted to learn more about the technical aspects of it. I wanted to get into all of the different realms. And so when you introduce me as Kathy's a poet, she's a climate envoy, but she's a poet, but she's also the director of this nonprofit. It's because I understand that this is an intersectional issue and I want to be at every intersection, uh, you know, every sector, trying to figure out how do all of these pieces fit? Because at the end of the day, climate change is this huge problem and it has to engage us at every level. And so, um, you know, for me as a poet, I write to, to engage my feelings, to engage my emotions and to, you know, to stay connected to the issue. That's what keeps me grounded and keeps me going when we're looking at such a huge problem. But I also work with our youth through our nonprofit, Jochigum. I make sure we organize that we're engaging them as well because they're going to be the ones inheriting the issue. Um, and then at the and then at, of course, in my newest capacity, something I'm really just getting into now is as climate envoy. And so within this role, I've been working with our government and with our ministers to make sure that um, to just advise and also represent our country at various climate change events and. Um, and to also help our national, uh, our national climate change directorate team in developing our national adaptation plan. So I think what's really important that I really want to get, you know, through to people through this webinar is that um, there is important work that is happening on the ground level that is very technical and very um, valuable. You know, we're not just sitting here being victims. We're not just sitting here waiting for the tides to come and wash us away. We are advocating at an international level, but we're also, um, we're also doing the day-to-day -day work of meetings and strategizing and answering these hard questions, one of them being sovereignty. And I would say that the most, the clearest way that we're protecting ourselves and we're protecting our sovereignty at this moment is through the National Adaptation Plan. And so, um, Marshall Islands for the past couple of years has been focused on mitigation, promoting mitigation, making sure everyone was curbing their emissions. We developed an energy roadmap to, uh, to eliminate fossil fuels and transition to renewable energy by 2050. Very, very forward thinking. And we did that first. We know we're one of the first countries to implement that and to also submit our NDCs, our nationally determined contributions. Um, great. But then we realized, you know, someone, a scientist came here, his name is Dr. Chip Fletcher, and gave us really startling climate science that told us that we can no longer just, you know, plan for mitigation. We had to plan for the worst. We had to start adapting. And so that's what we're working on right now is that national adaptation plan, the NAP, which we're also calling our survival plan.
the Marshall Islands is only two meters above sea level. So that means there's no mountains, there's no larger island to go to. We as Atoll nations all, all kind of share that identity, that vulnerability. Um, the latest uh, science that we've been given is that, uh, is the the best estimates we've been given is that sea level is that there will be a sea level rise of 5.9 feet in 80 years. So that's mm. all of the Marshall Islands submerged in 80 years because we're only two meters above sea level, which is about six feet, right? So what you have to also remember is that RMI contributes 0.00001% of the world's global mm. emissions. And so what yeah. you're seeing is the worst impacts in the region to, to all, all atoll nations from the countries that contribute the least. Um, so the National Adaptation Plan is, uh, is the way we're gonna protect ourselves, you know, and some of that is gonna be extreme solutions. And some of those extreme solutions are building islands, elevating islands. And then it becomes, where do we get that funding? How will we decide where we will, be, we will build the islands? Which islands will be elevated? which communities will be moved? What will happen to our cultural um, protocols of land ownership? Lots and lots and lots of questions, but the National Adaptation Plan is the first step towards answering that question. And so that begins first with statements of situation, gathering reports from all of the different sectors. How will your sector of education be impacted by climate change? Well, we have this amount of schools on this number of islands. How will, you know, maybe they'll uh, end up becoming shelters for when there's, you know, high tide floodings. Um, and then gathering all of the science that we have so far. You know, so far, most of the science that we have comes from something called the Reymalak framework. The Reymalak framework is conservation focused and it has some adaptation in it, but you can only conserve to a certain point before the whole island disappears, right? And so that's another part of it too. Um, and so we have that science, but not enough. And so I think that what we're really, the questions that we're asking ourselves is listen to, and what science is gonna inform how we plan for the future. But at the end of the day, we don't want to leave and we don't want to move. You know, I'm, I'm kind of like, um, I, I feel like I'm seeing a, a line from one of my poems, but that's the truth. And I think all of us in the Atoll nations collectively agree that migration isn't, shouldn't be the only option. It shouldn't be forced migration. So the National Adaptation Plan is our best bet towards making sure that our shorelines are protected, that our community is protected, and that our sovereignty is protected. Um, you know, it's really important that we maintain that sovereignty. Uh, as someone who grew up as an immigrant out in the March, you know, in the U.S., I know how difficult it is to grow, to live in the diaspora and to think of thousands of us, you know, having to be forced to make that transition, that it won't work, especially with, especially when you're looking at the U.S. right now with its current uh, immigration policies and, you know, the, uh, with, with the outright racism towards people of color and immigrants also. So I guess these are all different things we're taking into consideration, but I, I don't want to take up, I know it's already 840, but I think I, I just wanted to emphasize that, that, that we are here, we're doing the work, and that while migration is an option, um, we are doing everything we can to protect our sovereignty. And, um, uh, and because at the end of the day, we can't rely on the rest of the world anymore. And I think that's where we're at. Yes, thank absolutely you. Sure. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, that was very insightful. Thank you. <laughs> you know that, that that's true, and I and I think I I I like the point that you you kind of remind and kind of highlight the fact that you know we, we are doing our bit in the islands, but it's not enough, is it? Like you know, it's getting to the point where this conversation needs to change a little bit because yes, I think I I I do know when you talk to some people here, they think we just complain and you know we're not actually doing anything. But I think that's the important part. You know, we're we're trying to be proactive and we are making changes, but it's not enough. We need we need the rest of the world to get on board. And um, but yes, thank you, Kathy, and we're so thankful that we're able to have you share a little bit just before. <laughs> thank you so much. But um. Conscious of time, as um, she, uh, Kathy has brought up, we will also go to uh, Exley. I have a, we have a, one question we would like to um, get Exley um, to, to comment on. Exley, um, are, you, are you still there? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. 
still here. <laughs> Been so patient and just, yeah. Um, we have a question for you. So can I just, uh, what was our question, uh, team? If you can just bring that up so I can read it. Yep, no worries. Okay. So you have a question. This, this question comes to you from, oh, it doesn't have a name there. Okay. So I'll just read the question. From oh, from Wesley. Sorry, I didn't see the name, my bad. From Wesley. Okay. So the question here states, um, uh, last year, Tuvalu Australia joined other leaders of the Pacific Islands Forum and signed up for the, sorry, <laughs> I'm just trying to get the scrolling right, it's okay, signed up for the Kainaki Lua Declaration on Urgent Climate Action. Under the declaration, leaders of the Pacific Islands Forum call for all parties to the Paris Agreement to formulate and communicate mid-century long-term low greenhouse gas emissions development strategies by 2020. Australia has not actually produced a long-term low emission strategy and may not produce one this year. Is this, is, this, is this disappointing? And do you expect Australia to join other states like the UK and New Zealand and announce a long-term commitment to achievement net zero emissions by 2050? Thank you very much uh, for that question. And thank you uh, to my old friend, uh, Dr. Wesley Morgan as well for raising that question. I, I, I believe the, uh, the two um, highly esteemed panelists uh, that are also part of this uh, discussion may also have some views on that as well. Um, but I, I just wanted to, uh, to reaffirm what I stated earlier during my um, intervention that the Kainaki Lua Declaration is there. Uh, it's a baseline that has been signed uh, up to by all the forum leaders of the Pacific, including Australia. And so the 10 calls are still relevant. And as uh, Wesley mentioned, that uh, there's specific time frame, not just for the low emission development strategies, but also the um, revised nas nationally determined contributions as well, that um, those need to be uh, submitted and communicated by 2020. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, it, it's, uh, it's, it's an issue and, and disappointing if um, a, a forum member country bikes, bike trucks from what has been agreed to by uh, the leaders. And so um, I, I believe, um, and, and with your support, those of you that are in Australia in terms of where we need your support is um, to mobilize that support from uh, within Australia to influence the policy decisions of, of the government. And I think um, going forward, the uh, Paris Agreement is also very clear in terms of the timelines for the NDC and the low emission development strategies. And as I mentioned earlier, that COVID-19 should not be an, an, an excuse. And so what we are seeing is that a lot of our forum island countries are already in the process of reviewing their NDC commitments and also uh, some of all already in the process of developing their low emission development strategies. We have, uh, the um, Marshall Islands that has already submitted their revised NDC, uh, RMI and Fiji have already developed their low emission development strategies. And also um, it has uh, come out very clearly from the government of uh, New Zealand that they are committed to a 2015 net zero um, commitment as well. And so going forward, I think um, the onus is all on, on the uh, government of Australia uh, to ensure that um, all forum members are held accountable for what they have agreed to and signed up to at the regional level, and which is the cause of the Kainaki Lua Declaration in this instance. Thank you. And um, would any of the other speakers uh, wish to comment before we bring this to, uh, 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 yeah, to, the, to the last round? Um, or Kathy or anybody else? Okay. Okay. Um, so that concludes our Q and A session. Thank you to all the participants and um, uh, people who submitted their questions. Uh, the attendees, the panelists. Thank you all so much for your time um, and your insightful words. Um, yes, for sure. Thank you. Um, just in a, I guess we just can't can't stop thanking our, our speakers for being a part of this um, uh, our first first uh, series of um, online forums and. Just discussing um, topics that kind of mat that matter to us here in the Pacific, and especially here in Brisbane, from our from our climate change network in the Pacific Islands Council, um, to the Honourable Nelly Sapuanga, His Excellency Emma Tetong, Exley Tolaburi, and um, Kathy Jetno Kijiner. Thank you all so much again for being with us. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I might just pass it over to Emma for her final words. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, Pepe, and TK for facilitating the Palermo this evening. As mentioned by our distinguished speakers, sovereignty of our atoll island nations in this challenging climate change needs to be the forefront of our discussions and dialogue. And it is happening. We just need to continue to work together. And thank you for the, the thoughts and um, your deep thoughts that you've given us this evening, especially in particular, the, our esteemed leaders, uh, the Honorable Enelis Sopranga and His Excellency Anate Tong. You'll see that I'm getting emotional because um, just having a look at uh, what has happened this evening has set the scene of what uh, we would like to continue uh, as the diaspora communities here, where we can come together and discuss issues that are quite sensitive to our peoples. Um, having these frank discussions, and in particular at the moment, we are having these discussions with the young generation that will be the ones taking on the fight. So with that, I would like to thank a big to our uh, guest speakers, the Honorable Enela Sopranga, His Excellency Anate Tong, Kathy Jetnil Kitchener, and Exley Teleburu for being part of this first forum. It is our intention to uh, make sure that uh, the recordings of these online forums will be um, shared uh, to the attendees and also through our um, PICQ um, platforms. The third event is a face-to-face -face conference that uh, will take place in 2021. We will see what happens with COVID. On behalf of our joint organizing committee and also the Pacific Islands Council of Queensland, I would like to thank all of you who have attended this first forum. Uh, and I also have to mention the hardworking organizing team, particularly Sister Wendy Flannery of Friends of the Earth, Climate Frontlines, Nakawakalewu, Wendy. I also want to thank the PICQ Climate Change Network members for um, putting this forum together and the next couple of events. I will also need to say thank you to our IT group, uh, Ishara Sahama and Joel Lindsay from the Young Professionals of the United Nations Association of Australia, Terry Kwong, Cloudcast Media, thank you Terry, and the YMCA Acacia Ridge for the support that has been given to PICQ this evening. In conclusion, as we always do, we start with a prayer and we close with a prayer. So I would like to ask Taukie, if you can close our forum with a word of prayer. Thank you, Emma. Um, I will close our, our session tonight with a word of prayer. We thank you, Lord, for being with us and guiding us in our discussion and our deliberations. And we thank you for all the, the important, insightful, and very um, content discussions around this very important issue of uh, climate change and its impact on our sovereignty as Pacific Island, um, small island states. But not just that, also there are other small island states around the world as well. So we thank you, Lord, for guiding us. And we hope that you guide us um, after this session, and we ask you to bless everyone who have been part of this um, this event, and all, to all the participants and to all the, our guest speakers from around from within 
the region and also participants around the world. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. And we ask you all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Toke. With that, again, I would like to thank all of you for tuning in. Please uh, stay uh, uh, tuned in on our PICQ, Pacific Islands Council of Queensland uh, social media pages. We will be sharing the recordings of tonight's uh, uh, forum. Good night, Nisa Mwade, and good evening. Good night. Thank you very much.